Hey guys, welcome back to the Pulling Curls podcast today on episode 102. We are talking about college financial planning. Now don't go all ostrich on me, which is what I did when I heard about this when I had little kids. Let's just learn about it. There's some good tips in this one. Let's untangle it. the curly head behind the Pulling Curls podcast, where we untangle pregnancy, parenting, home, and even travel. We know there's no right answer for every family, but hopefully we can spark some ideas that will work for yours. Life's tangled, just like my hair. Okay, guys, before we get started, just a reminder to leave me a review. Reviews are how I get seen somehow. I don't know. There's like magic in a review. So create some magic by leaving me a review. Okay, today's guest is one of my favorites in the world, but don't tell him I said so. Hopefully he doesn't ever listen to this, but he is a financial planner in the Maryland area. He has lots of good advice. He's a dad to four. I want to introduce you to my friend and cousin, Joel Kundick. overwhelmed by all there is to do around your house. As a new mom, I felt overwhelmed at every turn. Fortunately, I turned to systems to make a change. Whether it's mornings, dinner time, or even just to climb out of a pile of kids' clothes, my course, Family Routines, can save you. I hold your hand as we smooth out these rough patches, making every day easier so we can more easily handle when your preschooler tells you they can use their urine like a lightsaber. Parenting is always going to be a wild ride. Routines are just your seatbelt, and they can support you. Use coupon code UNTANGLED to save 15% at checkout link in the show notes. Hey, Joel, welcome to the Pulling Curls podcast. Hi, Hillary. Glad to be with you. Yeah, this is so exciting. So Joel is my cousin and thinks he's smart about money. (laughs) (laughs) I think you actually know something about this topic. Like most of the things that you talk about. (laughs) You mean, like, I think I know things about things? No, no, I'm saying I don't know anything about the other things that you can discuss. So, yeah, so glad you found something I know something about. We're going to talk about discharge and pregnancy today with Joel. (laughs) (laughs) He's turning. Let me go get my wife. He's turning so red. It's so fun. All right. So, today we're talking about, we're getting into school time. We're talking about financial planning for college. I ignored this for a really long time because we just didn't have any money. So what is the point where you're at, where a person should be at financially before you're really thinking about opening college funds for your kids? Well, that's the reality for many families is that, yeah, if, if you just don't have money for it, then the number one priority has got to be retirement. That's got to be the goal that gets funded first. And so once retirement is getting properly funded, I mean, that that's to the point of 10 to 15% of their income. If they're in their 20s, if they're starting that in their 30s, it really needs to be more than that 15 to 20% of their income size. So retirement is the number one goal. The, 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 the saying is, you can get a loan for college. You cannot get a loan for retirement. So if, if families are looking to say, well, when can I do this? They have to first make sure they're covering their retirement goals. Okay. So is that 10% of pre-tax or after-tax? Like take-home income? Pre-tax is fine. Okay. Pre-tax is fine. Yeah. To, to, if they're starting their 20s, really 10% is, is enough to be meeting that retirement goal then. You just want to be make, making sure in all of these long-term goals, the number one benefit is the growth opportunity, right? Getting the money in early and giving it time to grow is the most powerful part of it. So what you want to do is make sure, for example, a company has the 401k offering, right? And they give you a match. Well, my goodness, you got to make sure you maximize at least that match and preferably put in 10% if you're starting your 20s, 15% if you're early 30s, late 30s, definitely more like 15 to 20%. But Sometimes families are having kids, you know, right in the middle of all that. You know, you're, you and Drew are like that. I was like that in our family. And just realistically looking at, well, how much can I put to this? You could say, you could take the argument of, well, let's just put $500 a year to this. We know that we don't have much, but we want to put something to it. So let's give it a placeholder. Because if you wait until things are comfortable, newsflash, things are never going to be comfortable, right? It's ne- you're never going to get to the point where money is just like, oh, great. We can put it to whatever we want. Joel, that is not the abundance mindset you should have. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess it, it, it's thinking about abundance early on and say, well, we don't have much, but we can put a little, right? Yeah. 
and, and so the vehicle you're going to want to put into, though, is a vehicle that gets you the maximum tax benefit. And the 529 is that vehicle for college funding. Think of a 529 like a Roth IRA, but for college. You don't get a tax benefit when you put the money in. Uh, there can be a small state income tax benefit depending on the state that you're located in if you open the 529 with your home state. But you're allowed to open the 529 in whatever state you want. Savingforcollege.com is a great website to look at to compare 529 plans. You get it into the 529. The benefit, the number one benefit of that plan is tax-free growth. So you want to make sure you don't build it and then put it in a CD. You build it and then put it aggressively in stocks to get that maximum growth over whatever time period you have until college. Yeah. Although we, right when the pandemic started, Connor was like, how aggressive is our stock in my 529 mom? Because I don't need to lose the money I'm planning on for tuition in the next two years because he'll graduate next year. You know, So we put it real conservative. That's the the other side of this is saying when you fund it initially, you're doing it for tax-free growth and you want to maximize the growth. But time horizon, and for me as a financial advisor is the top determinant of how you allocate. And when a goal has years until it ha- is going to happen, you ag- invest aggressively in stocks. There's yet to be in the last you know, 75 years, a 10-year time period where a stock-oriented portfolio hasn't returned positive. So you want to get the benefit of those stocks. Once a goal, though, moves into like the three to five-year range, that's when we start looking at dialing it back. And for college purposes, you dial back aggressively. For retirement, it's going to be a 30 years of spend, right? So there's you, you want to do a much slower dial back of that risk. College, as of hopefully only a four-year expense, you want to dial back aggressively and starting you know, like I say, three to five years before they go to school. Yeah. So probably when they hit high school. Yeah. Around that time is when you want to evaluate it. But last year would have been a classic example. Someone had a freshman uh, in high school and March 2020 hits. You do not want to dial back the allocation in your 529 in March of 2020. Now, April of 2021, very appropriate time to dial back the 529. You're saying markets are at all-time highs. I know that I need the money. It's coming in the next three, four years. Let's dial this back. Let's get this more towards cash. And I'd say definitely when college expenses are two years away. So by the time they're 16, freshman year uh, should be in cash. Oh, okay. So you don't, you wouldn't keep anything in the invested? Not when it's two years away. If it's two years away, I'd move that portion to cash. And some of these plans will do it automatically. This is another option that you can use. Some state 529s have what are called target date funds, where they'll do the investment allocation for you automatically. They'll say, okay, uh, you're putting it into a college 2024 fund. Well, then they're going to build into it. Here's, uh, you know, the target allocation for 2021 will be this. For 2022, it'll be this. It will glide path it itself for you. I don't tend to like those that much because they do a long, slow glide path towards more conservative where I'd rather just say, leave it in socks. You know, if you're putting it in for a child who's one year old and they've got 17 years until college, I don't want a slow glide path reducing t- stocks. I want in stocks for the first like I say, 12 to 14 years of it. And then we're going to start dialing it back. Now, we'll, and, and we can do that manually. But if you just want to kind of go with the easy set it and forget it solution, then you use a target date fund within the 529 plan if your state offers that. We did that and our, ours offers an aggressive or moderate or like less, whatever the word for less aggressive yes, is. Yes, conservative. <laughs> so you can like pick which of those of the target fund you want. So we switched Connor to, to conservative. Very appropriate. Yep. As it gets closer. Yeah. Yeah. Because I also didn't have the bandwidth to like pick stocks for my kids every month, every time I stuck in. Yeah. And, and this is not something you would want to change every month. Think of, of college saving, like any actually goal. It's helpful if families can think of this like a pension manager. And maybe they don't even know what a pension manager would think. But, but let me tell you what a pension manager would think. You invest for the objective, you don't invest based on today's Wall Street Journal headlines, right? You don't click on Yahoo Finance, see some article that says investors should and go over to your 529 and make chaotic adjustments, right? right? A lot of those articles are written to get clicks and views, not to give good strategic long-term advice. So we're investing for a goal. We invest it in an equity portfolio. And if your 529 has like, I'm, I'm in Maryland, uh, Maryland has what's called a global equity index portfolio. And that's what I'll tell clients to go in for the first 12 years or so of, of their child's life. And then you dial it back to more conservative stuff from there. Okay. Now you worked with pretty rich people, Rachel. All kinds. I have I have uh, you know clients with a couple hundred thousand dollars and clients with twenty five million dollars. Undocumented migrant workers are coming to Joel. <laughs> no, 
but you have mostly well-off people, right? Because pe- poor people don't afford you like me. Uh, I'm, I'll be open to conversation anytime. <laughs> but um, like, how are these people? Okay, okay, so Joel, of the the clientele that you have, which is kind of probably upper mid class, would that would be what you describe them? I'd say that, yeah. The, one one of the phrases we use is a middle class millionaire, right? People who have, or are saving toward that. You know, they're they're just average people who are doing a great job saving. Okay, when would you average most of them start a college fund for their kids? Are they starting it at birth? The best time to start the college fund is at birth, and honestly, the, the best time to fund it is then. It's funded aggressively then. And some of the families I work with, they are not affording college but they have grandparents who are interested in doing it. And if grandparents are interested in doing it, there's all kinds of options. A grandparent, I mean, I'll start at the, 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 the far end of things, right? Let's say grandma and grandpa have plenty of money and have said, we want to help out with grandkids and we just don't know how. Well, you can front load a 529 with $75,000 and that would constitute five years of gifting from the grandparents. They're allowed to give $15,000 per year without any tax consequences. And for 529s, they can use five years of gifts all at once in a current year. So you can do $75,000 and that would basically cover any kind of education expense that the child's going to have if they decide to go, you know, for your private. That is a lot of money, Joel. Yeah. So that's one end of the spectrum, right? And then I've got my clients who say, hey, look, grandma and grandpa are not interested. They've already funded my college. They've said these kids are on their own. So if you're looking to be able to cover in-state tuition for your child, I would start it at around $4,000 a year. If you want to be cover- able to cover the full full in-state tuition for your child. I do around $4,000 a year. You mean contribute $4,000 a year? Contribute. Because what are you aiming for, for an, a basic college education? Well, the difficulty is for the investments, I'd like them to earn about 8% per year for the first decade or so, right? And that's going to get me a double off of what I put in at the very beginning. But I know while the investments are hopefully inflating, college costs are inflating too. I'd like to say that that is going to end. We've seen certainly some trends towards not near as great of college inflation. I mean, we were reaching a breaking point, I think. As a country, I'm saying enough. We we can't grow college costs at five percent per year indefinitely. Eventually, only you know the uber wealthy will be able to afford college. So hopefully that slows. But college costs are inflating at the same time. I'm targeting somewhere around about hundred twenty to one hundred forty thousand dollars in that plan by the time the kid goes to college. If we're putting in four thousand dollars a year for eighteen years. Oh, that's a lot of money, Joel. I will be really transparent to all of you people. My kids do not get that much money to go to college. They get like a little nest egg and then they get to work at Chipotle the rest of their lives. And and I think that's fine. I didn't get that much money to go to college. My kids are not getting that money to go to college. So I'm just kind of setting the the, the bandwidth. I have clients... Look, I've got all, all varieties. I've got clients who say, look, I paid for college myself. It taught me a lot of lessons. I do not want to fund college for my children. I've got clients who said, I want to give them $10,000. When they turn 18, they can use it as they choose to use it. If they want it to use it towards college, great. I've got other parents who say, I want to cover half of in-state tuition for four years. And others that say, I want to cover housing, but I want my kid to cover the tuition because I want them to be incentivized to get good grades so they can get a scholarship to cover their part if they want to. And then I've got parents that just say, hey, I I just want to cover it all. Wherever they want to go, four years, in-state, out-of-state, private, whatever, and graduate degree, I want it all there in the 529. So I've really seen many versions of funding college. I think what's important actually for your listeners, most important for this conversation is have the dialogue with your significant other. Talk about what you are planning to do. Because there's a lot of couples I talk with where the kids are 15 and they have never talked about what their thoughts are with college. And that's too late, honestly, to do any kind of goal planning. And maybe there wouldn't have been funds earlier. Maybe there would have been. But I know when we have early conversations and we get on the same page as a couple as to what we want to do for college, then we can do a better job planning for it. Yeah, I really agree with that one. Because I think a lot of times you come in with separate ideas. Like my parents paid everything. My parents didn't pay much. Uh, My parents paid tuition and they'd throw me a 20 every now and then. (laughs) So, But I also went to a church school and it was super, super cheap. Like, my kids, I'm like, well, if you go there, it's you gonna have money. 
Right. Well, and that can set the expectations a little bit skewed, right? Sometimes where, where, where parents went to a very inexpensive school, their expectation can be for their kids, we want you to go to an inexpensive school. And there can be pressures applied in that regard. If it's a church school to, you know, live life a certain way that we start bundling college and lifestyle choices together, it can get very messy. So I, I just, I think it's good for couples to be on the same page. Then that as the children get older, I really think it's important to involve the child once they reach high school age. I have friends and family who their parents did not talk about how college was going to be covered until summer after senior year. And that just puts the child in a very uncertain place, certainly well in advance of where the child is looking at where they want to go to school. There should have been a conversation between mom, dad, and child to say, we love you. You know, we care about you. We brought you into this world. We've given you all these things growing up. And then from there, branch out in different directions. College is not a part of that. That's not an expression of love. It's a choice we're making to not cover your schooling. It's not because we don't love you. We know that you have friends who your parents, their parents are going to be covering everything. But we just want to talk to you about, about this right now. It probably would be a good idea for you to get jobs through high school to save some money because college is going to be expensive and we're not going to be covering it. Or, you know, all the way to the other end of the spectrum. We're going to cover everything. Don't think that every parent should cover everything. Don't talk to your friends about this as if it's a, a right. It's something that we've decided to do for you. And so plan on that you can prepare yourself for any school that you want to go to because this is what we want to do for you. So it's a very different conversation set that you have depending on your family's decisions and values related to post-secondary education. But you want to be open and upfront with the child. So what happens if that kid doesn't go to college? (laughs) Good question. So, well, for the college funding, what you have to be mindful of is that the 529 can only be used for education. It grows tax-free, but if you take the money out of the 529 and spend it on anything else other than education, and I guess I should define what education is there. It's tuition. It's housing if they're a full-time student, but not housing if they're less than a a full-time student. Uh, It can include a computer. uh, It includes books. But Tuition can be very broad category. They go, decide to go to cosmetology school. It works. They decide to, you know, get an apprenticeship to become a plumber. You can use the 529 for those things. You know, they decide to get continuing education of some kind. I, I have to do that for my certified financial planner designation. I would be able to use money from a 529 for that. The other thing that you can think of is if you have multiple children, you can retitle a 529 to the name of one of your other kids. It doesn't have to all go towards the kid that you initially named. And if, if the kids don't end up using it, and you just say, well, I, I don't want to take it out. I, I don't need it. And I don't want to pay taxes and penalties to take it out. I will just leave it there. And then if my kids have grandkids, I'll retitle it over into their names. Okay. Yeah. So there is a lot of flexibility. And I will say, my oldest is always like, can we use the 529 for that? I'm like, yes, we can. <laughs> like, yeah. you can use it for a lot. Yeah, it's pretty broad. And, and it's okay to have a period of not deciding. I, I just talked with a client's adult child the other day who took a couple years off school. He's now in his early to mid 20s. And now he's going back to college. And and so, you know, just because a child doesn't decide to be linear like most of the other kids and choose 18 straight off to school, that's okay. There's other other things. I should also say, if you end up having grandchildren, they recently opened up 529s to be able to be used for K through 12 private schools. So you can use up to $10,000 of a distribution from a 529 to cover K through 12. So then inevitably, I've clients say to me, oh, well, I'm thinking of sending my child to private high school. Should I use the 529 for that? And my answer generally is, if you want to cover college for your child, let's continue growing this. The number one benefit of the 529 is tax-free growth. Don't start thinking now what you can take it out for. Have it oriented towards growing stuff. Well, but or if they're a newborn, you could be like, I want to save for eight years of forever, I guess. Yeah. You could. Yeah. I mean, you could orient it towards just saying, like, for example, I want to send them to a private high school. So I'm just going to save extra in it in the early years and then I'm going to take money out for private school. One other thing you can do uh, that, that your listeners might be interested in, I mean, and this depends again on the state, but like my state of Maryland, we had not funded 529s. That was not something that we did in a major amount for our kids. But you are able to open a 529 for the child, get a state income tax deduction for the amount that you put in. In the state of Maryland, it's up to $5,000. And then you're actually able to take the money out the next day. <laughs> So in essence, if you choose to route your college money through the 529, you can get, you know, for state of Maryland, that amounts to about 
500 bucks of savings on college tuition every year. Yeah, that does make sense. It can. Some people say, well, that's too much hassle. I'm saying, well, it depends on what you value $500 at, right? If for you, that is worth the effort of opening the account, funding it, taking the money back out. That's all you have to do. And then you just write the check to the university. That's fine. Yeah. Is there any other account people should be looking at besides the 529 or the 529 makes the most sense? Well, a long time ago, there was something called the Coverdell ESA, Education Savings Account that was created, but that was only allowed to put $2,000 a year into it. And it just, once the 529 picked up speed, it became pretty clear that that was a kind of a defunct account. It's still there. It can be used. The other kind of account that can be helpful is a prepaid tuition account. And those are also set up by the state. You, in essence, pay the tuition that the state currently charges, but free yourself from worrying about any kind of inflation in future years. So the the prepaid tuition plans don't tend to grow as strongly as the 529s because they're really just keeping pace with inflation, which has been very low. But they can be an option. I'll tell you one situation I came up with a client recently for which they were very glad they had a prepaid tuition plan. They were residents of Florida when they opened up their plan. They moved to Tennessee, but they want their child to go to a Florida school. Well, the Florida prepaid tuition plan for some reason allows you to get in-state tuition in Florida. If you if you were a resident of Florida and opened up a prepaid tuition plan at that point. And I, I said to them, when we were talking on the call, I said, I, that doesn't sound very familiar to me. I researched after the call. Sure enough, they were spot on correct. If, as long as you were a resident of that state, when you opened up the prepaid tuition plan, then you get the luck of having in-state tuition at any of the great Florida schools when your child went to university. And so that was what they were going to use. And it was a, a better account then than the 529 for them, because if they'd used the 529, the child would have been out of state tuition in Florida. Yeah. The problem I saw with those is it pins your kid. You have to go to an in-state school, right? Well, it can. There's, there's a, an amount that it can direct towards another state's schools. Okay. But it doesn't tend to be as valuable. Like I said, it, it's, a, it's a lower value than the 529. And the, I, what I love about the 529 is I can put it in a global equity portfolio and get the growth that would come off of that for more than a decade. That's going to have a lot more growth in it than a prepaid tuition plan is generally going to have. Okay, good info. I've had some friends talking about starting a retirement account for their kids. And I'm always like, oh, I mean, we just shovel all that extra money into college savings. But I mean, do you think there's a benefit to that? Or I'll give you the example that I have for retirement accounts for uh, children. So you would probably have seen those ads that the dentists will put out like in the mailers and stuff with the smiling kids, you know, a lot of times those mailers, it's the dentist's kids that they're taking a picture of. They're paying them a modeling fee for that picture. And then they're, that, that's earned income. And now they can put that money into a Roth IRA for a five-year-old. And the power of that is you put money... If I, I put you know $3,000 into a Roth IRA when my child's five, and they don't need it for 60 years, uh, by the time they retire, it will cover a significant portion of their retirement. It's fascinating. So yes, you can open a retirement account for little kids uh, in that method. A lot of small business owners will do that to pay for their children children in, a, in some way to be an employee of the business, get a deduction for the business from it, and also fund a retirement plan. It's much more common, I see, for couples uh, who are trying to instill good values of savings into their teenagers. When their teenagers get a summer job, encouraging them to open up a Roth IRA and telling them that they will match their contribution. In order to save into a retirement account, you need to have earned income. You don't need to file a tax return. You need earned income. So if the child earns you know, $3,000 from a summer job and you say, hey, if you put 1000 of that into a Roth IRA, IRA, I'll match it. Now, all of a sudden, you start teaching that teenager, programming them programming them to think about matching. I mean, I'll remember, look, I, I, confessions of a financial advisor. I started working for Marriott the year after I graduated from college. Marriott said, we will match your contributions to a 401k to X percent. I said, whatever. I don't have any money. We need every dollar we've got. And I look back and I think, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, you, you, you get that match. I just didn't sit down and run the numbers and think, wait a second, that's free money. If I put aside $1,000 my pay goes up by $1,000 because they just give me a $3,000. You didn't need money, Joel. Uh, we... You were living the law of abundance. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> One other thing I'll say for uh, high schoolers that I think is a really good... This is the first major financial decision that these kids are encountering. And too often, I think parents shelter the children from it. The parents decide to shoulder the burden themselves, tell the kids to just look at schools and then quietly cringe. Oh, I hope he chooses an, chooses an in-state school. I hope she doesn't decide to you know, apply to Princeton. All of this could be alleviated somewhat by open conversation between generations. And there's just not been good enough cross-generational dialogue in our society on any topic related to money. And and this is a money topic, but let's start their, our children's adulthood on a good foot forward by saying, 
look, let's talk about this. And I work with high schoolers, uh, talk to them about planning for college. And one thing I walk them through is, is, look, answer four questions for me. Pick a job that you're interested in having someday. Research how many years it's going to take of study to get that job. Research how much it's going to cost in education to get that job. And then research the starting salary that you're going to have when you get that job. If they will research themselves those four questions, they'll be farther along than 80, 90% of these college kids kids who are going off to college as a life experience, not as a means to get a career someday. And I know my kids get way too much of that. Dad, the financial advisor, I boil it way too much down to numbers for them. Hey, what is our return on investment here? I understand from their feedback to me, hey, dad, that's not the only thing that matters to me with college. And I get that. But it should be one of the major components that should be considered. And oftentimes, kids just haven't drawn point A to point B. They haven't made the connection there. They think, well, I'm just going to study this. It's going to be fun. I'm going to love it. And they have haven't just figured out uh, that's going to be a hundred thousand dollars to get the degree and twenty thousand dollar your salary once I have the degree. Yeah, I always lusted after humanities and psychology degrees, and my dad was always like, "What are you going to do with that, Hillary?" There you go. <laughs> See, you, that, that, that that's blood talking there. I've been cut, cut from the same cloth. <laughs> yeah, my parents didn't think I was nice enough to be a nurse, though. So there's that. I mean. <laughs> There was no winning in my house. My dad thought I should own a business. Look how that worked out. Well, business owner, there you go. Yeah. All right. Super helpful. Guys, don't feel guilty if you haven't started saving yet. We always would save when we got our tax return back. So that's a good time to like think, could I throw some money in there instead of buying a boat? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, another good time to do it is if you get a raise, right? If if someone gets a raise and it's 3%, deciding, hey, before their first paycheck of getting that raise, we're going to start putting $20 a paycheck into a 529. It really, the, while I say the best time to start is, you know, birth, the next best time to start is today. Yeah. Right? Figure out what you can do, start there, bring it up in increments over time, and you'll be surprised those small differences, those small steps over time can make a huge difference. And they can make a huge difference for your kid. Because if your kid has $5,000 of a boost up, that is still $5,000 of a boost up versus a kid who doesn't. It's a big difference. And the one other thing I'll say, this is another of those practical, non it doesn't seem like a financial advisor tips. It seems a little bit too basic. But uh, you'll be surprised how many people have not mapped out the years that their kids are going to be in college, right? They've not mapped out, oh, I'm going to have one tuition for the first two years, then I'm going to have two tuitions for the next five years. And then I'm going to go back, oh my goodness, that's the point at which I need to worry. So sometimes I'll see parents get all excited when their oldest becomes a freshman. Yay, we can pull from the 529. And then they realize three years later, wait a second, it would have been much better to pull from the 529 now because we got you know the double barrel years is what we call them. You know, got two kids going to school at once and the costs are much higher and we really could use the help us and support in those years. Okay, so do most people start a 529 in each kid's name then? Because we have one for each kid. Yes, very common to have. Or do a lot of families just go like straight up, this is our 529 for all? Young no, I, I, I have few families that will do that approach. Some do. They say, I just want to simplify it. I want to put it all in the oldest's name. Most will open in each kid's name. And the benefit to that too is if your state offers some kind of tax deduction, usually it's predicated off of multiple 529 accounts. So I'll give two examples there for Maryland and Virginia, because there are two ways of doing this. Maryland, it depends on the funder. So if you want to op- maximize the state income tax benefit, I have to open up one, my wife has to open up one in the name of a child. And then if we want to do it for more kids, we'd have to do the same thing. So we'd have to have two 529 accounts for each of our children in order to maximize the annual state income tax benefit. Virginia does the opposite. They say it's by the beneficiary. So you even you need to open up an account for the child and you get a deduction for each child you've opened an account for. But they don't care whether it's in one parent's name or the other. You can have it in both parents' name, but you don't get extra tax deductions by the beneficiary. Oh, that's super interesting. I We get something in Arizona, but it's not great. So that's never been a... Yeah, I, I don't I don't think of that as the number one determinant. Again, you want to think of accounts for what their number one purpose is. The number one purpose of the 529 is tax-free growth. You know, you think that all of the other things are ancillary. You'd like to get the costs as low as you can. That's why you go to that savingforcollege.com website, try and compare costs. But even there, it used to be that some states did a horrible job on expenses and it was like over 1% per year. And other states had reasonable expenses like 0.3% per year. Once states finally realized that people were comparing costs, it became a race to the bottom. And every year states are 
are trying to get better on their costs so that other residents would be attracted to putting into their state's plan. So don't rely on the fact that the costs at present being the lowest are going to stay the lowest. And you don't want to switch from state to state every year funding a 529. This is that, That's overthinking it. Tax-free growth is the number one benefit. Get the account open, start funding it, and make it a disciplined, regular habit where you're putting a, a, a dollar amount per month into it. Okay. Good advice to everybody. Just start today. Don't hassle yourself on what you haven't done because you can't fix that now. Absolutely. All right. Good advice. Thanks, Joel. Glad to be with you. Okay. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode and I hope it didn't overwhelm you. So I want to be really clear and transparent about what we have ended up doing. My oldest is now a junior in college and we, we had some money when he was younger and we kind of like stashed a little bit when we got tax returns, like I mentioned, but we just didn't have a lot to put away, especially when you have three kids. And right as he was going to college, our business income increased a lot. And so we just shoveled money into a 529 for him. And we've continued to just kind of put a little bit into the 529 so that he knows how much he has. We will stop doing that his senior year. He'll know I have XYZ amount of money and he can draw from that. And that will be the end of it. So don't feel like you have to do things when they're little. I 100% understand that your income is a lot less when your kids are little. And hopefully, Hopefully it grows as your kids get older. And so child number three is going to have a very different number in her 529 when she gets to college. But hopefully we've kind of equaled it out because we've continued trying to shovel him some money as he goes along. He also got a full ride scholarship. He also works at Chipotle pretty much as much as you can while you're in college. And I love all of those things. I love that we're able to support him, but he also really is realizing how to live poor and also how to have that crappy job while you're in college. Because I worked at food service in my college and it sucked and it reminded me to graduate. So do what feels best for you. I love the advice of at least having the discussion with your partner and having the discussion with your kid to tell them kind of how much money you have to give towards them and then them making the decision because ultimately it's going to be them paying the loans in the long run, right? Thanks so much for joining us on today's episode. We know you have lots of options for your ears and we are glad that you chose us. We drop episodes weekly, and until next time, we hope you have a tangle-free day. Mm-hmm.